What's up my precalc people? In this video, we're gonna talk about the third free response question on the AP precalculus exam. Now the College Board has laid out an awesome framework for exactly what this question is going to look like. We're gonna talk about that framework in this video and then we're gonna look at a full example from the course exam description. Hopefully your teacher's actually already shown you this problem. And we're gonna walk through the problem so you can see how that framework matches the problem. Now I can promise you one thing, when you open up the AP pre-calculus exam in May, when you get to that third FRQ, it's not gonna look exactly the same as this question right here. But the framework of it will look exactly the same. So the more you examine these problems with me, the more you practice other problems like this that I provide for you in the ultimate review packet, the better prepared you're gonna be. All right, let's start talking about it right now. In the third FRQ for the AP Precalculus exam, students are going to work on modeling a periodic scenario presented in real life context, and they're gonna to have to model that situation with a sinusoidal function. They cannot use a calculator on this problem. In part A, students use the given information to identify coordinates of five labeled points on the graph of the sinusoidal function and its midline for two full cycles. In then part B, students find the parameters of the analytical representation of the sinusoidal function. Now in both parts A and B, the students are going to be required to construct the sinusoidal model by using the context to determine the vertical dilation and vertical translation of the sine or cosine function. That's going to affect your amplitude and vertical shift. And the horizontal dilation and horizontal translation of the sine or cosine function, which is going to affect the period and phase shift. Now in part C, students answer questions about the behavior of the function and describe the average rate of change on a particular interval. All right, let's look at an example of a third FRQ. The blades of an electronic fan rotate in clockwise direction and complete five rotations every second. Point B is on the tip of one of the fan blades and is located directly above the center of the fan at time t equals zero as indicated in the figure. Point B is six inches from the center of the fan. The center of the fan is 20 inches above a level table on which the fan sits, and the fan blades rotate at a constant speed. The distance between B and the surface of the table periodically decrease and increase. The sinusoidal function H models the distance between B and the surface of the table in inches as a function of time T in seconds. All right. A lot to take in there, and we're going to come back to all that in a second, but let's look at part A. As promised, in part A, you're going to be asked to find five labeled points on a graph of two full cycles or two full um, rotations of the situation. So the graph of H and its dashed midline for two full cycles are shown. Five points F, G, J, K, and P are labeled on the graph. No scale is indicated. No axes are presented. And that's okay. Determine the possible coordinates for F, G, J, K, and P. Now it's important to know that the coordinates are a time and then a height. The problem is very specific that we have a T that's gonna be uh, the time that this fan blade is rotating around and the Y coordinate is going to be the height that point B is above the table and they're calling that H of T. But again, that's the height that that point B is above the table. All right, now, what I like to explain to kids is don't jump and try to start labeling the points in the graph. Go back to the problem and create your own function. Create your own function. Create your own graph and then see how you can make your graph fit theirs. I think that's a good approach here. All right, so first we've got to understand what's going on here. Let's really take a couple moments to understand the picture. So first let's identify point B. There it is right there. And it says that it's located six inches from the center of the fan. That means in any direction, it's gonna have a radius of six inches. So if we come down to this bottom point of the fan, so that point B, when it rotates, it's gonna come down here to the bottom. That's another six inches from the center. Now we're also told that the center of the fan is located 20 inches above the table. Now that tells me that from that bottom point right there to the bottom or the edge of the table, whatever you wanna call it, that is 14 inches. So I just took the 20 minus the six. So if I'm thinking about point B, right, and time ticks by, point B is going to start to rotate. And it's gonna rotate in this clockwise direction. Now it starts at its absolute highest distance 
from the table of 26 inches. That's the 14 and the 6 and the 6 from my picture. So I'm already thinking that the highest this is ever going to be at its very start is 26 inches from the table. So I'm actually going to label that at time 0, it's 26 from the top. And then it's going to rotate down, and then it's going to reach its lowest point. At its lowest point, it's going to be 14 inches from the table, and then it's going to come all the way back to its highest point, again, 26 inches from the table. Okay, so now the next thing I have to consider, now that I kind of understand of what's going on in terms of the distance above the table, I now have to think about how long does this all take? Well, it tells us that it does five complete rotations every one second. So what I need to figure out is how long does it take to do one rotation? If they could do five rotations in one second, that means that it does one rotation in one fifth of a second. Five rotations in one second, that's one fifth of a second for one full rotation. So that's going to be my period length, right? And if you don't like fractions, that's 0.2 seconds. You could also work with decimals. It's totally fine. So now that means that if I start at the very top right here, which is 26 inches from the bottom or from the table, and I go all the way around, I'm going to end right back at that value of 26 inches above the table. And that's going to take 0.2 seconds. Okay, so there is the beginning and the end of my sinusoidal function. Now, then I'm going to start thinking about, okay, what happens as I rotate? Okay, so as I rotate and I get to right here, I am now 20 inches above the table. Okay, so that's my next point. My next point is right there, and that next point is 20 inches above the table. Okay, then I continue to rotate, and then I come to here at the very bottom, and at that very bottom, I'm 14 inches from the table, and that's my lowest point, right? I'll never get closer to the table than that, so that's my 14 inches, and then I rotate another quarter turn, and I'm right back to 20 inches above the table, so that's going to be right there, and this is not drawn beautifully at all, but I hope that you get the idea, and then again, after another quarter rotation, I'm full cycle, which is 0.2 seconds, all the way back to the very top, 26 inches above the table, so now I just got to do a little bit of math, all I'm thinking here is, Okay, let's think about the halfway, right? If it's 0.2 to go all the way around, then it's 0.1 to go halfway around. So at 0.1 seconds, I'm going to be at that low point at 14 inches above the table. All right, then I'm going to be at half of that. So half of that would be, well, 0.05. That is going to be a quarter of the entire thing, right? A quarter of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is one full cycle. A quarter is 0 0.05 of that. So at 0.05, I'm right here, right there, which is going to be 20 inches above the table. And then over here is going to be three quarters of a rotation, which is going to be 0.15. That'd be three quarters of a full rotation. Three quarters of 0.2 is 0.15. So here is that blade or, or that point B, right? It starts off at a maximum height, 26 inches above the table. And then it starts to drop to 20 inches. And then it continues to drop to 14 inches at its lowest. Then it comes back up to 20 inches and then back up all the way to 26. Now, again, that's a terrible drawing, but hopefully you see in this picture a nice cosine curve starting at its max, going to the midline, dropping down to its min, back to the midline, all the way back up to its max. Okay, so I'd like to make that graph on my own before I even go and start to label points. So now I'm going to come to this graph. I'm going to say, okay, where are the points that I like? Where are the points that I want to specifically look at here, right? So now I'm going to look at this as that nice cycle that I just looked at. There it is right there. And now I could label those points like I just did. So that first point F is 0, 26. That second point is G, 0, 0.05, 20. The point G, 0, 0.1, 14. Point K, 0, 0.15, 20. And point P, 0, 0.2, 26. That's my full rotation, full cycle, 0, 0.2 seconds. I'm back to that max of 26. So there I did. I labeled those points. But I think it made sense. Like if I would have used this, this kind of confuses kids, right? Because kids say, well, I'm going to start right here. This is where it starts. And they think, well, the, the point doesn't start at the midline. The point starts at its highest point. It starts at the max, the furthest distance from the table. And they start to get confused. So I like to draw it on my own and then make their points 
mimic mine. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. And I hopefully, you know, you explained that or you understood that pretty well. All right. Now point or, or part B says the function H can be written in the form H of T equals A times sine B T plus C plus D. And they want me to find the constants A, B, C, and D. So basically they want me to create a sine function that is modeled by this situation right here. Okay. It's actually really easy. All right, let's talk about some of the simple things that I noticed just from looking at this graph. First, I noticed the amplitude. The amplitude is the max or is the distance to the max or the min from the midline. So if I look at the midline right here in the middle, I go for that midline is at 20 and I go up 6 to 26, down 6 to 14. So that means my amplitude is 6. That's going to help me find my A value. Then I also notice the midline. The midline I just mentioned is the line in the middle at 20 inches. That's my midline. That's going to help me find my D value in a minute. And the other thing that I notice is the period length. That period length, again, was 1 fifth or 0.2 seconds. Now, these are what I call the non-negotiables. These three things are the same no matter where you look on this curve. And if you truly understand sinusoidal graphs from class, you know that any sinusoidal function can be written as a cosine graph or as a um, sine graph. Now, this particular question wants me to write it as a sine graph, but you could always also do a cosine graph. But these three things that I just listed here cannot change no matter if you look at sine or cosine or, or anything. It just doesn't matter. All right. So... What do I gather from this information? Well, the amplitude is my A value, so that's going to be very easy, A equals 6. The D is going to be that vertical shift up. That's going to be changing my midline, so that D value is 20. And then the period length. Well, this is where we got to do a little bit of algebra because the formula to find period is 2 pi over B. That's the formula to find period. Your B value is not your period. 2 pi divided by B is your period. And I know what my period is. My period is 1 fifth. So I know the formula for my period is 2 pi over B. The period is 1 fifth, or you could use the point 2. So now I have to solve for the B value that creates that period. So multiply the B over and I get 1 fifth times B. And then I'm going to divide by one fifth, which is the same as multiplying by five, and I get 10 pi for my B value. Okay, so I got my A value is six. I got my D value is a plus 20. And I got my B value, which is going to be 10 pi. So I got everything I need except for C. Now, to find C, you have to pick A sine curve. You have to actually look and find a sine curve in your graph. Now, this is what I like to do. This is how I teach it to my students. So I'm going to look and get a sine curve. So I notice this right away, right there is a nice sine curve. Starts going up to its max, back to the midline, down to its min, back to the midline. Okay. So again, the non-negotiables, the amplitude is six for that sine curve. The midline is 20 for that sine curve. And the period length for that sine curve is one fifth, which creates a B value of 10 pi. It doesn't matter what graph I look at, sine or cosine, those three things cannot change. But now my C value is gonna be, well, where do I have to shift? Well, right here at F, that's my Y axis because I'm starting at zero, right? If you're on the Y axis, your X value is zero. So this value right here is where I'm starting my sine curve and that value would be at negative 0.05 because that would be going backwards a quarter rotation. And a full rotation is 0.2, so a quarter of that would be 0.05. So that's where I'm starting my graph. So if I'm starting it there, then I actually need to add 0.05. So my C value would be positive 0.05, because remember the C value is opposite. If it's plus, you move to the left. If it's minus, you move to the right. So if I want to move it to the left, I need a plus 0.05. So here is what that graph would look like, looking at that sine curve I already mentioned. It would be um, 6, 10 pi for my B, 20 for my D, and then positive 0.05 for my C value. That would create that highlighted graph that I just saw. But here's the deal. You could look at other graphs as well. So for example, maybe I decided to look at this sine curve right here. That, what I just highlighted, is a full sine curve. But because it's going down first, that's a reflection across the midline, so I would need a negative on my A value. So my amplitude is still 6, but I need that negative out in front of it to cause that reflection. Now, instead of starting 
over here, I'm now starting right here at point G. So once again, if this is my Y axis because the X value is zero, then that means I'm moving it to the right. That's going to be a horizontal phase shift right 0.05. So because I'm moving right 0.05, my C value needs to be negative 0.05 right here. And that negative 0.05 is what's going to move me to the right. So basically, I'm trying to teach you that there's two different answers. In fact, there's actually many other answers you could use here as well. But they did want you to use a sine curve. I mean, if it was up to me, I would have used the cosine curve that I found in the very, very beginning. The cosine curve that looks like this. There's my cosine curve. That's what I would have used if it was up to me because that's the one I saw. But the problem did say to use a sine curve. So that's why I have to make some adjustments for that C value. All right. Hopefully that wasn't too bad, but you know, that, that can be a little bit tricky. So all I can tell you this is, listen, this is going to be the exact type of problem that you're going to see a graph. You're going to have to find your A, your D, your C, your B. So the more you practice problems just like this, which is what I have in the ultimate review packet, you're going to be able to do really, really well in this problem. All right. Now for part C dealing with rates of change. So the first part says, refer to the graph of H in part A. The T coordinate of K is T1 and the T coordinate of P is T2 on the interval T1 to T2. So we're looking at, you know, point K to point B. Which of the following is true? So this is basically a multiple choice question. Which of the following is true? So H is positive, increasing, positive, decreasing, negative, increasing, negative, decreasing. And then there's part two, which we'll get to in one second. All right, so first thing I'm just going to go and look back at my graph. They're specifically asking me to look over this interval right here from K to P, which is 0.15 seconds to 0.2 seconds. And they want me to describe, you know, what's happening to H. So first thing I notice is that H is positive. How do I know H is positive? Because because the Y values go from 20 to 26 and every value from 20 to 26 is positive. So that means that the negative can be get rid of because I'm definitely not negative. My, my, my values are clearly positive. Now, what's happening to those values? Well, um, they go from 20 to 26. So they're increasing. So it's not going to be choice B. So it's going to be point A there. So the correct choice is A, the values of H in the interval from point K to point B are all positive, ranging from 20 to 26, 20 to 26 are positive numbers, and the values of H are increasing across that interval from 20 to 26. The values are clearly getting bigger, and we can actually see that in the graph. They're going up. Okay, now part two says describe how the rate of change of H is changing on this interval. So now we're not talking about the values of H. We're talking about the rates of change of H. And here we're looking at concavity. So right away, I notice in this interval, I'm concave down. So the rate of change of H in the interval from point K to point B are positive and decreasing, again, concave down. If we examine points in this interval, we see that the rate of change at each point is positive, but over the interval, the rates decrease and become less positive. So if I just make a couple tangent lines here, like for right here, here's a tangent line, here's another tangent line. First, I notice that those tangent lines are positive, which means the rates of change are positive over this interval, but I also know that those slopes or the rates of change of those tangent lines are decreasing. That's why it's concave down. They're becoming less positive. They're all positive, but they're less positive. So that's why the rate of change is decreasing. Hence, again, I see concave down. So there it is. That's the final problem for FRQ number three. Again, you're not going to see this exact same problem, but you are going to see the exact same framework where you're going to have to label some points, build the sinusoidal function, and then answer some questions about rates of change and so forth. So be prepared for questions exactly like this on the exam. And the more you practice through using the ultimate review packet and doing practice problems I have just like this, the better off you're going to be.